Today's video is all about dealing with paper three, the two and a half hour paper that goes with the home A-level. But of course, some of what I'm going to say is also relevant for IAL paper six or paper three if you're taking it this year. My first piece of advice if you're taking paper three is do the graph first. And there's a very good reason for this. The reason I give this advice is because the graphs are always the same format. So for example, this is the graph that came up in November 2021. They're always going to be a log graph and the questions follow the same sort of trend. First of all, you have to log this graph so that you get it into the format of y equals mx plus c. If we have log l is equal to log k plus n log t. My advice would be rearrange this so that it looks the right way log l equals n log t plus log k and then all you're doing is underneath you're writing y is equal to mx plus c and you are demonstrating by doing that that you know why a graph would give a straight line it gives a straight line because n is a constant as they tell you here and n is the gradient of that graph the mark schemes say either directly or indirectly relate the logged version of this equation to y equals mx plus c, but I don't see why you would do it indirectly when you can just write it underneath and connect them. So make sure it's very clear so that you are certain you're going to get those two marks. The next part of it usually involves filling in a table like this. When you do the units for logs, be very, very careful. The general rule is you log and then put whatever is shown in these first columns into a pair of brackets. So our first one would be log bracket L in L sons, and our second one would be log bracket T in Kelvin, close bracket. That's the only correct way of doing it. So make sure that's what you do. And then you use your calculator, find this data, and you plot a graph of log L against log T. You can see that there are five marks for this part. The first mark will be for your, you getting those numbers correct. Usually we keep log numbers to three SF, regardless of how many SF there are in the raw data, because if you don't keep it to three SF, then you run the risk of the numbers being very similar. The final four marks in this part are for the graph. And these are always the same marks, the axes labeled with the quantity and unit, exactly the same way as you have on the top of the table. Sensible scales. That means that your scales are in ones, twos, fives, point ones, point twos, point fives per large square, and so on. Not only does your scale has to be, have to be sensible, but it has to fill at least half the graph page in both directions. So make sure, and that's for your points. So you can't just draw whatever length of line you like and say you've filled half the graph page. The points have to fill half the graph page in each direction. You can do your graphs either landscape or portrait. So choose whichever orientation suits your scale best. The third mark is for plotting the points correctly, so make sure you get that right. And the fourth mark is for the best fit line. Again, balance the points on either side of your line. Don't join the top to the bottom or other foolish things that people do. Make sure you have a 30 centimeter clear ruler so that you can balance those points. These are five marks, but it doesn't take an awful lot of brain power to collect, but it does take a little attention to detail. Doing this at the start of the exam settles you down. You know you've got these marks because you've paid attention to what you're doing and so you feel like you've had some success at the very beginning. These questions usually go on to get you to find a value for the gradient so that you can relate that back to the equation. Let's have a look back at the equation. It says determine a value for n. We know n is going to be the gradient here. They could equally ask you to determine a value for k, at which point you find the intercept on the graph and then anti-log that to get a value for k. Or I've seen questions where they ask you to then write the mathematical relationship. In other words, you're replacing k and n in this equation with the actual numbers. If you look back through the past papers, you will see it is always a log relationship and they're all tackled the same way. My second piece of advice is make sure that you know how to calculate uncertainties. There are rules that go along with it. It depends on whether it's a single measurement or whether it's repeat measurements. And I'm going to show you exactly what you should do right now. Our two methods for calculating uncertainties. If it's a single measurement, it is half the resolution of the instrument. 
So you need to identify what the resolution of the instrument is, and then take half of that. If it's repeat measurements, you find the range of the repeats, excluding anomalies, and do half the range of the repeats. That is your absolute uncertainty. You then put that all over either the measurement that you take for a single measurement or the average for repeats times 100 to give you percentage uncertainty. One of the favorite things that have been coming up recently is something like this, where you need to take two measurements in order to find the value of H here. If you have to take two measurements and they're two single measurements, we can see from the measurements that the smallest scale division, the resolution is 0.01 centimeters. So our uncertainty for that reading would be 0.005. The trouble is you also have an uncertainty of 0.005 centimeters for the second reading that you have to take. And those two uncertainties get added together to give you the uncertainty in H. Now, this is an example of using that subtraction method where you have to subtract two readings to get your actual measurement. It's also a good example of they're using a measurement to get you to infer what the resolution of the instrument is. So key points, single measurement, half the resolution, repeat measurements, half the range over the average. With this goes the idea of compounding uncertainties. And that means if you have to multiply two quantities together to get a calculated quantity, and each of those multiplied quantities has an uncertainty. In this case, you must calculate the percentage uncertainty for each quantity. You then add the percentage uncertainties together, regardless of whether you're multiplying or dividing those quantities. So any equation that is made up of three, four, five quantities, the percentage uncertainty in each of those quantities is added together. My third piece of advice is to know your definitions. The definitions are given to you in one of the glossaries at the back of the specification. But here they are for easy reference. Feel free to pause the video and jot them down if you want, or you can just go into the specification and find them. They have in the past asked for actual repeats of this. So it, if it gives you comfort, you can learn what some of the most common things are. So true value has been asked the value that would have been obtained in an ideal measurement. Accuracy, precision, repeatability, and reproducibility, let me just move this up, have also been asked, literally, what do physicists mean by the term accuracy? So it is a good idea for you to sit down and just learn possibly those four, just in case. The other reason why you would pick apart these little paragraphs here is because they often ask this indirectly. So how would you improve the repeatability of something in order to say how you would improve it? You have to know what that actually means. So my advice is to go in, read through them, make sure that you can understand what these paragraphs are telling you about the definitions of these terms. And the most common ones, you should be able to produce their definitions exactly. A question like this is a very good example of why you need to know those definitions and then apply them. Because they are very well aware that in the old days with the old papers, precision and resolution were interchangeable. Not anymore. You need to know the difference between resolution and precision and accuracy. These are not the same things. So a higher resolution instrument does not guarantee either an increase in accuracy or an increase in precision. Another very common question is critiquing somebody else's results or method. And the first of this kind is to critique the recording of the data their table. And there are some usual things you can say about this. The first thing you check is whether their raw data is to the same number of decimal places and their process data is to the same number of significant figures as the raw data it came from. So for example here, all of our radius raw data should be to two decimal places because it was made with the same instrument and that is true. However, all of our height raw data all should also be to two decimal places and that is not. So that's your first critique. The height should all be recorded to the same number of decimal places. Another thing we could say is that they have no unit for their 1 over r. That should be recorded with a unit and this 11.1, .1, that should be to one significant figure because the raw piece of data it came from is 1SF.
The other type of critique you can be asked to do is someone's method. And so it's very important here to read the information you're given and look at the diagram and use your practical sense here. This example, he's positioned the source 20 centimeters from the GM tube and it's emitting alpha, beta and gamma and he thinks that 20 centimeters away he's going to detect and clearly there's a problem with that. Other ones I've seen is where the setup, the measuring the extension of a spring and the ruler is simply too far away. There's no way to determine if the ruler is vertical. Use your experience with practical work. Put yourself in that situation and say, what issues would I have with measuring this quantity if this was the exact setup? The fifth piece of advice here, accuracy is king. So many questions ask you about how you would improve the accuracy or how you would minimize the error so as to improve the accuracy. And let's have a look and see the kind of thing you can be asked. Remembering that accuracy is how close a measurement is to the true value. And there are some things that affect accuracy. Systematic errors and random errors. With systematic errors, you can do things like zero error checks. So that's always a good one if you have, are having to say how you would improve the accuracy of readings zero error checks, random errors are much more difficult to control. Things like parallax error end up being random even though you think they might be systematic because the readings will be different. Variation in instruments, variations in temperature in a room, these are all random effects. That will move your measurement away from the true value. Now to reduce the effect of random errors, we tend to do repeats and take an average. Please remember that an average calculation does not remove random errors. The idea is that it smooths them out, so one compensates for the next, but you have to use the phrasing reduces the effect of random errors. And of course, measuring something over a longer distance or a longer time makes sure that you are removing or reducing any timing errors, reducing their effect. So it's very similar to taking an average. And a best fit line does the same thing. So doing something experimentally rather than just calculating a value allows you to draw a best fit line, which means that you are having the same effect as an average. So if you're assessing, if the procedure contributed to the accuracy, think, did it eliminate systematic errors as much as possible? And did the student make an effort to reduce the effect of any random errors that might creep in? More examples. Would this method produce accurate values? How could you modify the method to produce, produce more accurate values? How would you minimize the effect of a significant source of error? It goes on and on. In this paper alone, and these are all from the same paper, November 2021, there were 20 marks, all on the same sort of thing. Comment on the suggestion that this would be more accurate. How would they make their values more accurate? How did this contribute to the increased accuracy? And there's our balance question again, which had accuracy and precision in it. So you need to boil down how do you assess a method or a procedure in terms of how accurate it makes its values. And once you've boiled that down, could you make it better? And that is all about, again, being detailed oriented and controlling what is going on in your experimental procedure. Make sure that everything is vertical, that you're reading everything at eye level, that you have measured as long a length as possible, that you, or a time as possible, that you have zero checked everything to start with, that you do as many repeats as is reasonable, that you do it experimentally instead of just through a single calculation. I hope this has been helpful for you. Please do comment and ask questions in the comment section and I will do my best to answer them. This part of the paper is 50% and is very difficult because it permeates throughout the A-level course. So there isn't really anything that you can do to sit down and learn it, apart from looking at those terms and making sure you understand them. The rest of paper three is content from papers one and two. From the whole of the course, often the questions are synoptic in that they take material from multiple topics and combine them together. The same advice applies for those sorts of questions as applies for every other question on every other paper. And that is, know your content, 
sort out your information when you're starting the question, change any units that you need to change before you start, write something sensible. For every question, something is always better than nothing. And usually, if you start putting something down, you start calculating something, it will inspire you to continue and you'll be able to figure out what to do next. Best of luck, everyone.